Here, my friends, is where the new Russian intelligence weapon enters the picture. What I am about to reveal I am revealing primarily for history. I know, even before I reveal it, that some of my listeners will desert me after they hear it, saying, It just cannot be. But, my friends, I also know that the events in the days ahead will be impossible to understand without knowing this secret. So I do not ask that you believe it simply because I say it. What I do ask, and I ask it for your own good, is that you keep an open mind. Listen and hear what I must now reveal, then watch events themselves. My friends, since World War II and before, scientists the world over have been probing for the basic secrets of life itself, and in this field, as in others, Progress has been much faster than the public has been led to believe. Today it's common knowledge that heredity is governed by something called genes, yet barely a generation ago this relationship was only beginning to be suspected. When it was suggested in 1944 by a theoretical physicist, Erwin Schrödinger, it was a novel idea. Beyond that, no one was too certain what genes were, aside from huge molecules or clusters of molecules. Some thought they were molecular chunks of protein. Some thought they were something else. When Schrödinger's ideas about genes were published, World War II was still raging, and basic scientific research was on a back burner. And yet, barely a half a dozen years later, researchers were zeroing in on a building block of life even more basic than genes. The solution was found to this revolutionary puzzle in April 1953 at Cambridge University in England. Scientists James Watson, Francis Crick, and Maurice Wilkins were later to share the Nobel Prize for solving the puzzle. They had discovered the molecular structure of DNA, the famous double helix. In 1968 Watson published a book titled The Double Helix, published by Athenium, New York, New York. To understand the overwhelming importance of the double helix discovery in 1953, one need go no further than these few words on the jacket of the book. Quote, DNA is the molecule of heredity, and to know its structure and method of reproduction enables science to know how genetic directions are written and transmitted, how the forms of life are ordered from one generation to the next." Unquote. In other words, to understand DNA is to begin to understand life itself. It has now been over a quarter century since the crucial discovery of the DNA double helix, and since then Research in molecular biology has not been standing still but speeding up. In some cases research has gone in directions which are deliberately sheltered from publicity because of the fear of public reaction. Not so long ago, for example, universities doing research into artificial microbes found their neighbors in an ugly mood when they found out about it. Test tube babies are now a reality, and that began not long ago in England where the mystery of DNA was first unraveled. Then, of course, there are clones, that is, creatures which are reproduced by artificial means and which are exact duplicates of an original. Clones of all kinds of animals have been produced successfully in the laboratory, but that is not what bothers people. In the recent past it has been claimed that human clones are also possible and that some may already be in existence. These last claims about human clones have been ridiculed, denied, and suppressed by all kinds of officials. The reason is that the idea of duplicate human beings impinges upon a super-secret realm of intelligence activities by both Russia and the United States. True clones are not involved, but something that bears a superficial resemblance to cloning is going on. And the last thing the powers that be want is for you and the public to have any hint about what is afoot. In Russia as well as in the West, research has been underway for many years in biological synthesis, that is, artificial life forms, and according to high intelligence a stunning breakthrough took place in Russia some years ago. The Russians refer to this breakthrough as a providential discovery, something they learned almost by accident. 
They discovered the key to creating what are known as organic robotoids. An organic robotoid is an artificial robot-like creature. It looks and acts exactly like a human being, and yet it is not human. A robotoid is alive in the biological sense, but it is an artificial life form. Robotoids respond to conventional routine medical tests in the same way as humans do. They eat, they drink, they breathe, they bleed if cut, and they can be killed. Robotoids can also think, but they think only in the sense that a computer thinks. Like any other computer, the brain of a robotoid has to be programmed for each assignment it is given. But unlike many electronic computers, the biological computer brain of a robotoid possesses an enormous memory. As a result, robotoids can be programmed to communicate and think in such complex patterns that they act human. Organic robotoids are remarkable creatures, but they have many drawbacks. They don't grow or reproduce, but must be manufactured one by one in the desired form. They also have a very limited lifespan, measured in months or even weeks depending upon how they are utilized. This is due to the fact that their metabolism, while it resembles that of humans, is very inefficient. A robotoid can be manufactured on very short notice, a matter of hours, but after a few weeks or months it suddenly begins to degenerate physically and mentally. When that takes place, the robotoid has to be removed from service and disposed of. To extend its useful life as much as possible, a robotoid is customarily cooled down to slow its metabolism between assignments. Organic robotoids are extremely expensive, troublesome creatures to produce and utilize, and robotoid capabilities do not exceed those of human beings. All they can really do is simulate human beings, but my friends, for intelligence purposes that's all they have to do. To produce an organic robotoid it is necessary to have a pattern to go by. The pattern required is that of genetic coding taken from a few cells from the body of a human being. In this respect the Russian technique sounds like cloning, but the technique itself is totally unrelated to genuine cloning. A robotoid is produced within a matter of hours and it simulates the human donor at his current age. Like any man-made copy of anything, a robotoid is never a perfect copy of the human that is to be simulated. There's always small discrepancies in appearance and behavior but these are seldom great enough to arouse any suspicion. When the initial Russian breakthrough in robotoids took place years ago, the Rockefeller Soviet Alliance was still functioning. The Christian group who now rule Russia were already secretly more powerful than the Bolsheviks, but the final overthrow had not yet taken place. When the robotoid breakthrough took place, they moved quickly to minimize the amount of information obtained about it by those Bolsheviks still retaining positions of power. They also tried to prevent information about it from leaking through intelligence channels to the CIA. Nevertheless, partial information did reach the CIA and the late four Rockefeller brothers. By early 1975 the Russians were known to have successfully created at least one organic robotoid in the laboratory. Meanwhile the CIA was coordinating a feverish research effort aimed at accomplishing the same feat. Up to now, robotoid technology in the United States is far behind that of Russia. The American capability in robotoids is not even close to being operational, whereas the Russians are deploying them right now. But there has been at least one attempt to create an organic robotoid for public use in the United States, and I'm referring to the final fate of the late General George S. Brown. In April 1977 I revealed how much General Brown had sacrificed by that time as the price of doing his duty for America, but not long after that General Brown paid the supreme price for his actions. It is only now that I am free at last to reveal it. On July 10, 1977, General Brown was taken to CIA headquarters near Washington, D.C. in Virginia. There he was taken to one of the many secret rooms designed into the CIA building by Nelson Rockefeller. The room was a laboratory, 
and the attempt was made to create a robotoid replacement for General Brown. The techniques employed were far more crude than those used in the Russian process, since the CIA process required General Brown to be on the scene. The attempt ended in complete failure. A crude facsimile of General Brown was generated, but it refused to come to life. Even so, General Brown could not be allowed to live because now he knew too much. And so on the evening of July 10, 1977, General George S. Brown, the last great patriot in the United States Government, was murdered. A normal human double was found for General Brown since a robotoid attempt had failed. This was the man who testified in the role of General Brown at the Congressional hearings on the Panama Canal Treaty September 27, 1977. At his side throughout, briefing and prompting him, was the Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown. Occasionally the double would be flustered by a question and look down at the table in front of him until the Defense Secretary whispered something in his ear. Then he would look up again, say what he had been told, and so on. Once the Panama Canal hearings were out of the way, the double for the late General Brown was seen as little as possible in public. Soon there were stories that he had contracted cancer. Then the Air Force Chief of Staff General David Jones began acting as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs months before the end of General Brown's tour of duty. In June 1978 we were told that General Brown was retiring, and last December 5, 1978, we were told that he had died of cancer. At that point the General Brown double collected his pay and headed for Frankfurt, West Germany, where he landed on December 11, 1978 at 3.30 a.m. local time. It is a standing rule that doubles for important people never live long. And so at about 7.30 that evening General Brown's double was shot to death in the back of the neck. Last month I revealed that an intelligence war of doubles had erupted in the United States. President Carter, Vice President Mondale, and their wives had fallen victim to this War of Doubles as their Easter breaks away from Washington were ending. Now I'm sorry to report that Amy Carter, Billy Carter, Lillian Carter, and Hugh Carter all died soon after Jimmy and Rosalind did. All of them, including Amy, have been replaced by Doubles, but instead of the Bolshevik Doubles who had been waiting in the wings, those we are seeing are Russian organic robotoids. The voice of the Jimmy Carter double, which was reproduced last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 45, is the voice of a robotoid. That robotoid was the one who was dazzling everyone with his vigorous new image. Only a few months ago Carter had been limping around with what we were told were severe hemorrhoids, but now, out of the blue, here was a Carter who was a powerhouse, hiking, fishing, and jogging ten miles a day. He also looked and sounded younger than before. That was the first robotoid double for Carter, which I referred to last month as Carter No. 2. By the time I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 45 there was also another Carter robotoid making the rounds. This one, Jimmy Carter No. 3, was the one that attended the Holocaust observances in the Capitol Building here in Washington. By contrast with Carter No. 2, No. 3 looks noticeably older and more haggard. As I mentioned earlier, robotoids are very good copies, but they are not perfect. No two look exactly alike. Last month I mentioned that the doubles for Jimmy and Rosalind Carter were spending a great deal of time at the Russian Embassy here in Washington instead of at the White House. Now I can tell you why. Robotoids are programmed at the Embassy for each assignment. Between assignments they simply rest there in a state of reduced metabolism. When the Bolshevik coup d'etat against the Rockefellers began four months ago, the Kremlin rulership already knew that Bolshevik doubles would soon be on the scene, and they knew that if the Bolsheviks were allowed to complete their takeover of the United States, Russia would soon suffer. The Bolshevik plans for nuclear war against Russia are a blueprint for suicide for America, but they have not been abandoned. Up until now the Russians had been keeping their robotoid capability under wraps, and there was a real question whether they would ever be used. But the Bolshevik coup d'etat convinced them the time had come to deploy the robotoids. 
Now they are using Nelson Rockefeller's hit list. And using their robotoids, the Russians have already altered the course of world events in dramatic ways. Genes were published, World War II was still raging, and basic scientific research was on a back burner. And yet, barely a half a dozen years later, researchers were zeroing in on a building block of life even more basic than genes. The solution was found to this revolutionary puzzle in April 1953 at Cambridge University in England. Scientists James Watson, Francis Crick, and Maurice Wilkins were later to share the Nobel Prize for solving the puzzle. They had discovered the molecular structure of DNA. The Today it's common knowledge that heredity is governed by something called genes. Yet barely a generation ago this relationship was only beginning to be suspected. When it was suggested in 1944 by a theoretical physicist, Erwin Schrödinger, it was a novel idea. Beyond that, no one was too certain what genes were, aside from huge molecules or clusters of molecules. Some thought they were molecular chunks of protein. Some thought they were something else. When Schrödinger's ideas about famous double helix, in 1968 Watson published a book titled The Double Helix, published by Athenium, New York, New York. To understand the overwhelming importance of the double helix discovery in 1953, one need go no further than these few words on the jacket of the book. Quote, DNA is the molecule of heredity and to know its structure and method of reproduction enables science to know how genetic directions are written and transmitted, how the forms of life simply because I say it. What I do ask, and I ask it for your own good, is that you keep an open mind. Listen and hear what I must now reveal, then watch events themselves. My friends, since World War II and before, Scientists the world over have been probing for the basic secrets of life itself, and in this field, as in others, progress has been much faster than the public has been led to believe. Here, my friends, is where the new Russian intelligence weapon enters the picture. What I am about to reveal, I am revealing primarily for history. I know, even before I reveal it, that some of my listeners will desert me after they hear it, saying, It just cannot be. But, my friends, I also know that the events in the days ahead will be impossible to understand without knowing this secret. So I do not ask that you believe it.